I'm Jillian Spencer. I am guest hosting. I'm subbing in for Zach tonight. Zach was unexpectedly abducted by aliens who fancied his lovely bow ties. Tonight's topic is one that's very near and dear to my heart as a theology student, women's ordination. I have here with me tonight pastor of family ministries at Pacific Union College Church, mm -hmm. Norma Osborne. Now, Norma, did you, did you choose to be ordained? Actually, that's kind of a complicated question because I didn't choose to be ordained and yet I did. And, and the story is that um, the members of a church that, that I was serving at the time were so frustrated by the fact that the North American Division had been told, no, you can't step out and ordain women, that after that vote in the general conference session, the members of the church said, we have to do something. It's only right that we step in. And, and they wanted justice to be done, I guess. Um, and so they came to me and two other women and said, we want to ordain you. And I must say that for many weeks, I said, no, I don't want to be part of this controversy. I don't want to, you know, cause any problems or anything. But, you know, I kept praying about it. And, and then I realized that the people that I was ministering and serving in our church were the ones who came and were saying, we want to do this for you, but you are doing this for us as well, that, that we want to do it. And, and then I talked to my brother-in-law, to make a long story shorter, and I said, you know, would it be, do more harm to be um, ordained or would it do more good? And my brother-in-law said, Norma, it would be more good. He said, you never know. It's like Esther being at that point in history. You don't want to be there at that time, but, but you are there for such a time as this. And so with that encouragement, with a lot of prayer and a lot of support, I said, yes, I will take part in that ordination service. So that's what I did. Wow. So then what does a woman have to do to be ordained? <laughs> the joke is they have to have the right plumbing. I... Um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but you know, uh, j just just as the men, as the men, they, uh, you know, um, being there, feeling God's call, um, being prepared, being shepherds, being servants, allowing God to work through them, um, feeling that call that that God has called them to a very particular ministry, and um, ordination as such, for me anyway, is. Is, is a matter not of God saying, okay, you're ordained and, and, and you're blessed because God calls us at the very beginning anyway, and, and we feel that call. But what ordination becomes is men in your church and women in your church and children and families in your church saying, we recognize the call that God has given you and we want to be God's blessing for you. And so the, the placing of their hands on my shoulder when that service took part was, was empowering. God had already empowered me, but to know that my brothers and sisters and my fathers and, and, and mothers and, and grandparents and uncles and aunts were all saying, we're, the, we're right there with you, we know God has called you. It was very empowering, very, and, and, and it made me say to myself, why? Would anyone want to withhold the blessing from anyone if it empowers them to work for God? You know, why would we want to withhold the blessing? But it is a hot issue, and there are many places where they, they just feel that women should not be ordained. Now, when talking about this hot button issue, there's two terms that get thrown around a lot, ordination and being commissioned. What's the difference between these terms? I don't recall reading the term ordained anywhere in the Bible. No. <laughs> tell, tell me a little more about this difference. Well, I, I, I'm not speaking officially for the church. I, I'm not, uh, you know, okay, this is just me. <laughs> um, but my understanding, you know, whenever, whenever we have problems in the church, we have to sort of come up with solutions. And so sometimes they can come up with a different definition or a different word to describe what we're doing. Um, so, so we, we chose commissioning. But as Jim Pedersen was saying yesterday, officially, the difference between ordination and commissioning is if you're commissioned, then you are allowed to do all the, um, the baptizing, the weddings, the, the um, funerals, the um, preaching, the services, the elders' communion, all that kind of thing within the particular conference in which your church is located, in which you've been called. And um, 
if you're commissioned, you're more localized. If you're ordained, it's worldwide. Mm -hmm. I, had a, I had such a, an unusual experience. My nephew wanted me to be part of his wedding ceremony and, and do blessing for him. And because I wasn't ordained, I had to write a letter to the other conference president and say, my nephew wants me to take part in his wedding service. Can I have permission? Now, no man would have ever had to do that, right? Of course not. <laughs> but but that, that, you know, that was many years ago. And hopefully things have changed a lot. I'm, um, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I know that a couple of conferences, like Jim Patterson was mentioning in California, have said, well, we'll give the commissioning slash ordination credentials to both the men and the women. Mm -hmm. So the men and the women are both equal. Um, some people feel that's just kind of covering up the issue, and, and maybe it is. But I, I was just, I was thinking about that today, and I realized that, um, you know, we can get really, for, for some people, this kind of a non-issue. In fact, you yeah. asked me a question about, well, isn't this kind of a sexist kind of a thing? Isn't, you know, yeah. isn't it, it, it really, uh, for me, I think it's a non-issue for people your age who aren't theology majors or, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. why do we even discuss this, you know? But um, it's a reality in our church, and it's like, why isn't equality real? Why do we still have differences and all that kind of thing? And the only thing I could, could think and gave me great comfort was that um, even when Jesus came to the earth, God sent his only son to show the world a better way. He didn't convince everyone as a huge group. He didn't have the whole Jewish community deciding, yes, this is the right way. Let's walk in it, did he? He did it person by person, group by group. He got around him 12 disciples and he said, now you go and get 12 and you get 12 and go out two by two and, you know, that sort of thing. He met so, them where they where they were. Exactly. Met them where they were. And, and that's where we are right now. So I, I, I can get off preaching here, but I'm not a <laughs> preacher. But, you know, uh, so this is where we are right now. And, and we can get upset and, and uh, mad and so on about it. But that doesn't help anything. Mm -hmm. it, it, just, it just, but what we have to do is it just because, you know, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. I'll take care of you. I'll be with you always, etc. It doesn't mean we just sit back and be doormats. That's okay. not the interpretation, is it? it it's, it's, it's rather, um, do it my way. Do it mm -hmm. Jesus' way. And so we have to sit back, step back, and say, okay, how did Jesus do it, and how can we do it? So then what would be your advice towards dealing with this issue, and maybe a, a little bit of advice to those who uh, aspire to ministry, men and women alike? Right. I, I, I just encourage you to answer God's call. If you have God's call, God is going to bless you and take you forward. And you can't become discouraged. Let not your heart be troubled because God has everything in control. And even though that means we have to work within imperfect system, that doesn't mean we give up and walk away. Although I think it's easier to do sometimes. And sometimes we have to weigh, you know, do I stick with this and be discouraged but keep going because God called me? Or do I walk away, be happier, and do it this way? So I, I can't give the answer for everybody, except I can say just don't give up easily, you know, and, and find the support in the mentors because they're out there. You know what the sad thing about life is that the silent majority aren't heard as much as the vocal minority. And so the vocal minority who are against it, are heard sometimes a lot more than those who are for it. Then mm. what advice would you have towards the vocal majority who... The silent majority who, sh who maybe could become more vocal and, yes, and you yes. know... Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm not sure I have advice right now. You know why? Because... How can, how can you talk about something if you're not passionate about it? So mm. if it's not a hot issue in your life, and you talk about it, but you're not passionate about it, you're not going to convince anybody. So I think we have to leave it to the people. You know, the reason I'm ordained is because there are some people who took up the banner to say, we have to do this. I couldn't take up the banner. They, they Someone else could. They cared enough about it. Yes, they cared action. enough about it. They were passionate about it to do that. Mm -hmm. So we, I don't think this is a cop-out, we have to sign... We have to let the people God calls to take up the banner, take up the banner for those issues.